What a race. Max Gunther scores a brilliant home win for BMW, but a strong recovery drive from Antonio Felix da Costa has put him on the verge of title success. This is the Inside Electric Podcast, and I am your host, Rob Watts. It was the second closest win in Formula E history, and for the first time in four races, it's not Antonio Felix da Costa. Max Gunter uh, came out on top in a race-long battle with Jean-Éric Byrne and then outpaced the charge in Robin Fryens on the last lap to secure a memorable home victory for BMW. With me to chat through all of the day's action are Inside Electric co-founders Hazel Southwell and Peter Leung. And we're also pleased to be joined by a very special guest. It's award-winning Formula E photographer, Lou Johnson. Hello, Lou. Hello. <laughs> Uh, Lou is in uh, Berlin at the moment. Lou, quickly tell us what you're doing in Berlin. You're not at the track, are you? I'm not. Uh, so normally I shoot for teams such as Mahindra, um, but this time I'm working for Formula E uh, themselves and I'm working in their kind of hospitality sort of thing that they're doing at the moment. So it's a drive-through cinema sort of, uh, sort of feel to stream the race so that fans and um, guests can come and watch the race together. In a socially sounds, distant, safe way. Of course. Right. Sounds very cool. Um, if you are a first-time listener, we are an independent co- uh, podcast covering Formula E and electric motorsport. You can find us on the socials at Inside Electric or online at inside-electric.com. Coming up in this episode, Max Gunter's home win for BMW was the second closest winning margin in Formula E history. We'll be dissecting that. It was another good day for Antonio Felix da Costa, who retains his 68-point lead, and he could possibly win the title tomorrow if results go his way. And what a birthday present for Robin Frines, who scores second place and his first podium since New York in July after a last lap pass on Jean-Éric Byrne. Hazel, we spoke quite a lot last night um, about... No, it wasn't last night, Thursday, sorry, uh, about BMW's inconsistent form. So I don't know whether Max Gunter's listened to our podcast and he's done that just to annoy us, um, but he's kind of just proved us right. Um, how do you explain that? Um, I mean, I think you have to say that it's a team who clearly have good equipment, like the car can run well on, on a good day. And they have drivers who can take advantage of a moment where they they see a gap where they've got uh, either the ability to to like as Max did today like uh, be well up in super pole to put in those fast laps and they then be able to hold onto it in the race place or it's just all over the place and and they don't seem to be able to consistently put that together like. It, it's not that I think the team don't have any idea where they get those results from when they do. Um, but clearly there's a range of things that affect the operating window of the car. Um, as with any team and any car. Um, and sometimes it seems like a lot of the time they'll sort of fix one thing and knock something else off. Um, and occasionally that will turn out to be fine. Uh, and just the pace of the drivers and the car itself will, will carry them despite that. But a lot of the time, it's sort of, it seems that either, either it will suit one car, but it actually will do something awful to the other, um, or the, just it creates these unpredictable results where they can't really say why things went wrong um, a lot of the time. I suppose it is, it is the nature of Formula E, and we've seen that a lot this season. It's been quite rare to see a team get too cars high up in the points it's usually one or the other isn't it um peter what what do you make of um the the battle that he had with jev today uh it seemed to be a, a better day for jev or for much of the race anyway uh, but it was pretty close wasn't it it didn't seem to go much beyond a second at any point in the race it, it was it was pretty tense between those two yeah, at the beginning of the race uh, uh you know it was it was quite conservative everyone was It was almost procedural. Everyone was kind of, quote, behaving, at least by Formula E standards. And it was it was quite a a processional, you know, Vern got a really, really good get get away. I think he built easily built a a two second lap while uh, a two second gap while everyone was fighting behind. And then uh, when Gunther started chasing him down, he actually said this after the race that it was very calculated. 
with, uh, with the Berlin circuit in the counterclockwise uh, configuration, which is the original one, um, there are a lot of uh, overtaking opportunities especially in the third sector with all those hairpins. So uh, Gunther really made note of that and leveraged that to his advantage towards the second half of the race, which was what he really, really focused on. Just chasing and pushing Vern as much as he could to uh, try to get him to defend and possibly make mistakes. And also Gunther was benefiting from Vern's slipstream, so he had more usable energy uh, after after the safety car, and he could really sort of attack and really force uh, Vern to uh, make you know potentially a, a, any mistakes. And ultimately, uh, with in in, in, the, in the closing laps, he was able to uh, get past and and stay there. But with uh, with Robin Frines uh, coming up the charge, and he knew that um, uh, Robin had had more energy than than uh, than he did. Um, Gunther really had to to sort of defend, and that was one of the reasons why he he made the pass when he did. He made the decision himself, as he said, uh, rather than listening to what his team was telling him was like, you know, all that matters is the last lap. He really yeah. made the conscious effort to say uh, he was going to make this pass stick in order to be able to preserve his uh, his position. And from then on, it um, it really paid off for him, and uh, he won the race. So, yeah. Lou, what do you make of Max Gunther this season? Because one, one thing that's impressed me um, is, and, and as Peter said there, I think it was Santiago when he won, uh, he, he timed his pass for the lead almost perfectly, and he appears to have done that pretty much well. He won by 0.1 seconds, so we couldn't have timed that much better really um he had just enough energy to to defend it and he seemed to time the move right as well what do you make of him this season he seems to be when he's got the car underneath him he seems to be an incredibly impressive driver and he and he's he's calculated he knows when to take risks and when to sort of wait for his opportunity it's a lot like driving one of those cars is so complicated and you've got to do everything you've got to do a lot more kind of management in the car and he just seems to have just whether it's instinct, whether it's whatever it is, he's just got this amazing ability to just know the perfect timing and to manage energy as well. Like today to kind of go, I've got one chance and my team is saying last lap, but actually now is my chance. I've got to make it stick to do that. And to not, to just not fluff it up. Like he could have easily crashed at that point or lost everything, but he didn't. And he does it. They're very sensible moves. It's never tending to be too risky. It's just very calculated. It's very, no, no I'm going to make this move. It's going to stick. It's, and like, I think we kind of also see it in his sim racing as well. Like, it's just yeah. clearly his race craft. Like, and it's, and I think maybe Formula E just suits the way that his brain works within the race car. And you kind of, you can see that some drivers take a, a bit longer to kind of adjust and stuff. But clearly, obviously, BMW saw his performance last year and just went like, yeah, we'll have him. Like, every time he's been in Super Bowl, every time he just, it always just appears to be the perfect timing. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's, that's definitely due to kind of his understanding of the entire series and the cars and stuff. So, um, yeah, I rate him really highly. Um, I'm really pleased that he did well today because, like, that was a cracking move and an amazing, like, T just the yeah the timing i'm in, i'm in awe like <laughs> you see so many like we get we get a variety of different things in a formula e race don't we pretty much everyone we get great overtakes that are a bit risky and it's like oh like and then you get then you get something like that and you and yeah very impressive good a good show <laughs> well, it definitely good was a good show it was an exciting last couple of laps as well hazel one of the things um you see often in in in, in formula e um, people talk about sometimes, okay, Formula, Formula E critics, I suppose, talk about Formula E sometimes being a little bit destruction derby, like it seems to be a bit chaotic, sometimes a bit too chaotic, and and just taking risks it seems to be well, some driver's approach, just you think you're, the cars are indestructible, so you just chuck it up the inside. But but Matt seems to be a lot more calculated than that, and it, it's it's an it's a skill, isn't it, in Formula E? To and, and as Lou has said, there he's only been in the championship two years. He's adapted extremely well to it. 
he's intelligent and he knows how to preserve energy and, and he, his racecraft now is is coming along leaps and bounds and remind me how old max gunter is because he's not he's 22 young, i think, I think. He's 22 super yeah. young three yeah so 23 22 22 23 to, yeah. to come into to formerly into have adapted uh and, and and to be on this level in less than two seasons how how do you rate him uh and where, where would you sort of place him in front of sort of the, the young talents on the grid the potential I, future champions maybe yeah i mean definitely i think i think you'd have to put him in a list for that um i think max uh when he um when he was in Formula Two, uh, he made a very conscious choice to do the rookie test and then to to consciously work his way into Formula E. He stopped bothering with anything to do with Formula One and, and dedicated himself to first getting that dragon seat um, and then uh, going on to take the BMW seat. Um, he had a really difficult first year in a team with operational problems. Uh, you know, we've spoken about Dragon so many times. Um, and uh, and the situation that Max was in there, where he was finding out race by race if he'd be driving for them. Yeah. Um. He got. Yeah, I mean, a, it really was one race to the yeah. next, wasn't it? Nothing. Yeah. No, nothing more than that. Um. Uh, and that's that is really difficult to drive in. It's really difficult for a driver to perform in, especially when the team is already in a shambles, which and a not very performing car. And you know what Max achieved, especially given that was really impressive. What he also unfortunately achieved was a bit of a reputation with the other drivers for being slightly crash happy, or at least uh, prone to risk taking, uh, because that was partly how you could get those kind of results out of the Dragon. Actually, his more experienced teammate, um, uh, Petito Lopez, was was causing quite a lot of the havoc, and, and Max was taking, um, I, I felt at points, Max was taking the blame for stuff that, that actually was Petito. Um, but uh, who will admit to you himself that last season in Formula E was not a dignified one for him. Um, but yeah, and, and I think coming into the BMW factory team, there were, they, they knew that they needed to help him with his racecraft. They knew that they needed to help him make good moves, not just sort of risky ones and ones where he was making his own strategy calls because that's what you have to do if you're driving a Dragon because nobody else is going to do it for you. Um, and uh, yeah, where he could um, kind of develop as a driver and, and become sort of lose this reputation as somebody who causes incidents. Um, and then, yeah, it hasn't, I wouldn't say he's 100% shed it yet, but I think it's very clear, like the, the fight with Jev and Jev is difficult to overtake. Like Jev is, he does not make it easy, no matter how experienced you are. And, and a fair number of drivers have ended up getting into at least a sort of bit of wheel rubbing with him in the process of making an overtake because he doesn't want to give up the place. Um, I mean, which driver does? Um, and, you know, the, the Max was able to tangle with him for lap after lap really, really closely and then um, take that place uh, twice. Um, once with the attack mode and, and then Jev coming back on him and that be clean and then it'd be another clean overtake uh, for the win. I think, yeah, you've you've got to respect somebody who is in their first year in a decent car um, because, you know, realistically, if he was fighting with Jev last year, then what, why are you fighting with Jev? Your car is nowhere near as good, you know, you're barely in the same race. Um but but to be able to fight with somebody who's been in Formula E for so long and who is the double champion and who every driver on the grid rates as difficult to overtake, difficult to fight with, um, that's that's really impressive from Max. Um, I know he, he sort of doesn't like it when we're all like, oh, he's only tiny, but like he is, uh, which is totally <laughs> understandable because it is patronising that we're all like, oh, look at the little baby. Um, uh, well, compared but, to us, he is. Like... Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, he's not quite young enough that I could be his mother, but he's not far off. Um, and, <laughs> uh, the, yeah, he's, 
he's clearly dedicated himself to learning this style of racing and to learning how to do it really well um, and to be able to do the things that Formula E drivers need to do which is that you don't you do have a strategist and you do have a, a performance engineer and like it's not that there's an absence of a team around you but there's no pit stop you need to choose when you use your attack mode and you need to manage how you activate your attack mode and, and what you do with it and things they can't tell you what goes on with what well, I mean they can tell you what they think you should do but ultimately it's you that does it um, and there's no a lot of what you have to manage in the car there is nothing the team can do to help you um, and you need to be able to make those calls yourself and you know I think we've seen actually like um, Antonio he was talking about after the race on Thursday, he was like, I've been in a backmarking car. I've been in a car where you were really, really struggling um, and you had to make the most out of every opportunity. And I think that's probably taught me a lot of like what to do in a front running car or maybe not so front running car. Some of the time that Tachita this weekend, even though or this, this week of racing, whatever we're calling this, um, uh, even though he's made it look quite mm. easy. Um, and yeah, I think Max, you can see he, he's able to do the same. And it's not that Alex can't, he also absolutely can. Um, but yeah, I think, I think a lot of the consistency in BMW, such as there is any, is actually in the drivers more than, more than probably a lot of the other stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Sims has probably just had a bit of bad luck in the last few races uh, because up until this point, they were what I, I, I wrote a piece. Um, before we, before Berlin on, on looking at the title contenders. And one of the things I said in that was how Max and, and Alexander Sims, they're, they're two quite different drivers, but the end result often mm. seems to be quite similar. They, they were one of the closest pairs on the grid, if you look at statistically, um, on a number of things, they were quite close, um, but, but quite different drivers. But... Um, Max has obviously had his day today. Um, Peter, let's talk a little bit about that that battle with Byrne because although mm. um, Jeff did slip to third, um, you know he was leading for a long part, and he and, and the main battle for this race was uh, Max and and Jeff. Um, Jeff seemed a bit more comfortable today. Um, he took pole position. Um, it's funny he was talking about some superstitions. Uh, in, in this morning, um, I don't know if uh, drivers drivers often have these funny superstitions, don't they? But he seemed to be a bit more comfortable today, and he did say after the race that his regen pedal wasn't working properly and he was struggling for energy. Um, said it was useless to fight Robin for P two, but for the most part of that race, uh, it seemed to be a little bit more like. The, the Jonic Fern that, that we, we might have expected coming into these races um, rather than the previous two races where he's had a bit of a nightmare, to be honest. Uh, I think also seeing his teammate Antonio doing so well has really sort of galvanized him and sort of motivated him. You know, it, essentially, they, they, they are in the same team, so they have this uh, similar machinery, at least. Not the, not the exact same car, but like similar, similar machinery in, in, in that it could give them good results. And uh, I think he saw, you know, Jeff saw that in, uh, in how well Antonio was doing, and it really, really motivated him. Uh, he did cheekily say that um, it was that massage that he had. <laughs> really, really good massage, it must have been. Who did um, he get a on... massage off? I have absolutely no idea, but uh, I was I was told the massage therapist was late, so oh. that was the only thing I knew uh, about that. But he also did like a lot of other sort of superstitious driver things, like he reverted back to his um, original helmet. Yes, he binned he his he binned his like uh, he binned his underwear, like just 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 all all those little things, basically anything. And apparently, I do off. the same when if, if we have a podcast that I'm not happy with, <laughs> I, I, I destroy my underwear. Just recycling um, bin. Um, yeah. yeah. So so it was um, it was a, a return to form for for the reigning champion, and uh, you know it was and 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 the thing is you know starting from pole position that really gave him the best chance to. Uh, win the race. He didn't do it, but he still ended up on the podium and banked some valuable points 
um, and really helped in the in the manufacturers uh, championship. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for 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 that at least, um, I think Jeff knows he's probably out of the title running, but yeah. he would have wanted to have. Because let's not forget, you know, Jeff is involved in that team in, in a much bigger role than just the driver. But he would he would desperately want them to win the team's championship, so yeah. he will want to have scored a big load of points to ensure that they do that. And like um, you said, so they, like with um with sorry, with Robin, on. um, you know, he could see it was a prudent choice with uh with letting robin by because he knew that he had so much more energy and it was just going to be a futile fight going into the end so it was it was kind of a uh, a race to to sort of preserve as and and score as many points as possible for the team and that's what he did today so he was a uh, in in that way jeb was a was a very much a team player today uh lou um, l- let's just talk a little bit about robin frines because he's had a really poor season and i think he will probably admit that um, coming into Berlin, he had been out qualified by Sam at every race, and he had only, I think, scored ten points, which, by his standards, is really quite poor. Um, but he seems to be really back on it now after the break, and he looked very, very strong today. Um, how do you, what do you make of his weird season and this this sort of late surge of form? And um, we, we mentioned this a little bit before we started recording, possibly one lap longer, um, Robin might have uh, thought he might have had a good chance of maybe even winning that race today. I think, I think we always say that like when any, any race kind of finishes so, so tightly, it's always like, well, oh, one lap longer. <laughs> maybe we... Um, you're right, um, because we because we absolutely love drama, and yes, like that wasn't that an amazing end. Um, it's just it's fun to think yeah. what if. But yeah, no, totally. No, I agree. I'm I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. Um, yeah, I think I don't I, I don't know. In in is the honest answer. Like I I really like Robin. He he just seems very down to earth. Like and just as a character, a great guy. And as a racer, I feel like he's always been a little bit. In, like inconsistent like he's been maybe stable but then occasionally you have these just absolute joyous moments of seeing what he's really capable of of and he'll just blow you out of the park and you're like this is this is amazing like when he won in Paris and everyone was like yes finally like yeah yes, this has been coming for so long and we it did feel a long time coming yeah and actually then you kind of forget that he, he had a year out like he wasn't in uh Formula E for what was it season was it season I do forget that you know because like, it of, feels like he's been around forever yeah, and he's such a character yeah. and you sort of kind of forget that he had that kind of time away and like when he came back he came back really strong again and then kind of trailed off a bit and and maybe like I don't know person I'm gonna say personally here I think I've with my photography not the same obviously but I've kind of feel like I've upped my game you have four months off and you realize that you don't have the thing that you love the most in your life yeah. and the mo- your career and everything. And then you, and you're going to fight for it. You're going to want to go, right. I'm going to take the best photos I can. I'm going to drive the best races I can because I'm just happy to be here. Like the Costa was busy saying in a couple of interviews, like that he was just great. He doesn't really care that we have to wear masks or whatever it is. He just wants to be racing. And obviously we've got like, we need to get the fans back and we need to, kind of be able to hopefully be pushing towards racing in a normal way, whatever that is, but racing on a track. Yes. Yeah. Like that's, and, and I have a feeling that a lot of drivers maybe are feeling very similar um, that it's just nice to be like sim racing is great. And I'm really pleased that we had that, but I don't, I think for a lot of these drivers in the same way that I was shooting uh, digitally as well for some of these kind of race at home series and things, it's not the same. It's not no, what we know. It's close. For sure. And that's great. And I'm wondering whether maybe Robin and, and a couple of others who've kind of really done well this, this weekend, like Da Costa, everyone who's sort of kind of gone, they've got that like mental jump of that little kind of like, yes, we're back. Let's do this. And I feel like whenever Robin's in that frame of mind, you see like special Robin, like where he does really great. So, he, he does seem to have returned with a bit of fire in his belly. Yeah. And um, a fired up Robin Frines is a very quick Robin Frines. Yeah. And it's good to see as well, because uh, as much as, you know, 
uh, you know, I like to see Sam do well. I think if he'd have ended up his last season with Virgin absolutely thrashing Frines into the ground, I don't think it would have been entirely reflective of, of their ability, in, you know, contrasting ability, because I, I think Frines is a very good driver. And I think the first half of the season doesn't reflect that. So it's good to see him back uh, in the points and, and, and racing for podiums because... Um, you know, it, it did not feel like the Robin Frines that we know in the first half of this season. Um, I want to move on to some of the other drivers who've had a good day today. Um, there's a couple of ones that I want to save for Hazel um, for good reason. Um, so you're going to make me be nice about Andre Lotter again. <laughs> How did you guess? Um, <laughs> So we'll we'll start we'll start with Peter. Um, so aside from mm-hmm. Günther and Freins, obviously, it was a good day for De Costa as well. He moved up four places from eighth on the grid. Um, he seemed to have a patient race today, um, but he made up quite a few places in the sort of final ten minutes, and ultimately he he could have nicked a spot on the podium. It doesn't look like there are any team orders there. It looked like him and Jeb had a, just a straight up front fight on the last couple of laps. And I don't know what the final gap was, but I think it was pretty close between them. Um, do you think De Costa would have played that safe or do you think he was tempted to maybe take the risk and chuck one up the inside? Or do you think that would have just ended in tears if, if they'd have come together? Yeah, when I saw... Um... When I saw the two tech cheaters were together, I was like, oh, is this going to be like, you know, Jeb and Andre in, in that race and just just getting getting together and making contact and just screwing it up for everybody. Uh, the gap actually between the two tech cheaters was 0.2 of a second. So it was very, very close still. Um, but I think Antonio, you know, the, the he, he's not putting too much pressure on himself. Um, you know, he said uh, before the race and also after the race that he was just out there having fun. And, um, you know, we've still got three races to go. So if he doesn't do it in this race, he can always do it in the next and the next and the next. He has such a comfortable and and almost insurmountable gap in the in the in the championship right now that you know he can really afford to sort of not put too much pressure on himself and just go out there and race his heart out um race to his heart's content basically you know he was he was really really carving up the um the field towards the end of 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 the race just because you know when we we like we talk about um those those passing opportunities you really want to make the most of it because the later you make the move you know the the high likelihood it's going to stick so um i think that's what that's what antonio was was doing today and with uh just want to bring it back to jeb's qualifying performance and also race pace clearly that the ds powertrain is on another level so antonio clearly knows that he has the car under his feet um to to get a decent finish just so that he as long as he sort of stays stays out of trouble which is exactly what he did today uh antonio after the race he also said that you know there were some things there were some some minor improvements that they're going to make for sunday's race um, but you know, nothing too crazy, just wanted to clean a few things up. So it's just a matter of honing and just improving just, just those little incremental steps because he has such a strong baseline already with this DS car and also this Berlin track. So, um, I think tomorrow and, uh, uh going forward, he's, uh, he's, he's just gonna keep doing his thing and have fun out there. Yeah. And I think his last... Uh, six races have been second, second, first, 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 fourth. So that's not bad. In Good consistency book. right there, which it's we keep bad. preaching about Formula E. You know, you need the consistency to win. We weren't really talking about first, 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 first. But, <laughs> you know, they were, he's, he's definitely consistent, if not anything. So um, this is a bit of the, of any episode that I always look forward to. It, uh, <laughs> we call this segment, let's get Hazel to say something nice about Andre Lotterer. Um, (laughs) another very strong drive again from Lotterer and we were talking about Robin Frines there about coming back with a bit of fire in his belly if you just said to me that um, Andre Lotterer Lotterer, uh, would have been one of the standout performers 
in these first three races. I, I, I'm not sure I would have seen this coming. He scored, I think, 30 points now um, in those three <gasps> races. Um, and he's got, I don't know if my maths, if you listen to the other uh, podcast the other night, uh, you'll, you'll learn that my maths isn't the best. So the, uh, that could be anywhere between 20 and 40. <laughs> but I'm going to say 30. <laughs> um, but it was another very good, strong drive, Hazel. I'm sure you'll agree. And Porsche, in Lotteris' side of the camp at least, have come back in pretty good form. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I think... And moving on. That's all Hazel is willing to say. Uh, no, I think you, you do have to uh, look at it as... Um, Andre, so obviously we know that there's likely to be a bit of movement of Porsche. Um, the airline is uh, likely to take one of those seats. It's very unlikely to be Lotteris. Um, so... Um, Wouldn't have thought so. No, he has scored 100% of the points for Porsche this season, um, whilst Neil Jarney has just been, like, really stricken, to be honest. Um, and, uh, like, you have to... It is 30 points, by the way. I just worked that out whilst oh. I was speaking. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, you, you have to respect the fact that he's obviously spent time maybe the team weren't quite ready for stuff when they first entered, but they, they, we kind of knew that, like they knew operationally, they had very few people with any experience in Formula E, they basically had Andre, um, and uh, that it was going to be sort of a transitional year for them. Um, and so, uh, yeah, um, I think um, what, maybe what he's been able to do is whilst there was the break um work on um making sure that that they can take advantage of, of different opportunities or possibly he's just worked out things about Tempelhof which has a very unique surface um I said just worked out like this is a challenge that all of the teams are facing and because the surface of Tempelhof which is this ultra bumpy you see the cars like running over it and it's very um you can see them being jolted around because it's a an airport runway and it's built for mm. aircraft tires, which are enormous <laughs> yeah. um, compared to, you know, if you think about a cargo plane, uh, then it's the, what that worries about in terms of irregularities in a surface of, is very, very different to a dinky little race car, the size of like, we've all seen luggage, um, yeah, luggage trolley things when they're going mm. across the runway surface and like your suitcase yeah. is being yeeted off the back of one of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> no! <laughs> but yeah, so so I think, um, it's so like when we say people work out the, the surface in Tamberhoff better than others, it's because it's really difficult. Um, and Lotterer has obviously been able to put together like three really good races. Um, he's also, he has ended up, the entire time he's been in Formula E, to be honest, quite often tangled in incidents um, and for whatever reason I don't know if it's something that he's specifically been working on um, or just good luck where a lot of people his own teammate included have had just horrific luck um, uh, and like we should at some point talk about James Collado's worst week ever. Um, mm. but, We're coming on to that. Oh right okay um, uh, but yeah Lotter has been able to avoid those incidents to have clean racing and, and that makes a huge difference to be honest like if you're not ending up tangled and compromised in like with your steering column half bent by by three laps in then yeah it's gonna it's gonna go well for you so well done to him well done to who sorry oh well done to Andre yeah no he's 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 been mm -hmm. doing good racing I yeah. yeah, I feel like I should clarify. I, d I genuinely don't hate Andre. I just, I just, <laughs> <laughs> I just don't hype him as much as everybody else. So just, just for the record, for the listeners and and <clears throat> watchers on YouTube, that is, that is Hazel Southwell actually giving Andre Lotterer a something resembling a compliment. Yeah, it's just there's been a long running joke on these podcasts uh, whenever we talk about Andre. You know, we, we'll say something like. Oh yeah, you know, I was impressed by Andre Lotter today and Hazy would be like, well, you know, I mean he was okay. Yeah, so it's great to hear some positivity uh about Andre Lotterer today. 
uh, which I think he deserves because I think he's been really impressive the last few races. A um, couple of uh, strong recovery drives today. Mitch Evans, uh, 19th to 9th, which is, which is very strong, but obviously it's not where he expects to start or finish. Um, Sims as well, um, down in 16th. He recovered through to finish 10th, so a good race for him, but again, qualifying troubles, just not where he needs to be at the moment if he wants to have a strong end to the season. Uh, Lou, let's bring you on on this one. Um, Mahindra, you know the Mahindra team well. You've worked with them a lot. Uh, Jerome D'Ambrosio. So Mahindra have had a little bit of upturn in form since coming back. They seem to be a bit more competitive. They are still having a bit of trouble with efficiency. Um, they don't seem to be able to li- deliver on their promise in qualifying. Uh, Jerome was third i think on the grid today which is very impressive um but slid back to p7 but that is a decent haul of points considering and you know they they'd scored points the other day as well how do you feel the mood will be in mahindra after those first three races back i think they're going to be taking this as a as a step forward from kind of where they were at the kind of the start of the the season and kind of feeling that they've actually moved forward in that four month break where, you know, I'm pretty sure like a lot of the teams, there was, there was furlough schemes in place and, you know, they didn't really work all of those four months. It's not like they literally spent every single day being able to progress the car and actually they've, they've moved factories. Um, they've had a quite, they've changed a driver. So actually to take that into consideration, to hire some new people as well. I think they've got some new uh, some new people back at the factory and stuff as well. And they're continuing to build on this this team. Um, they're moving away um, from, it was kind of announced last year, they, they were obviously working with QEV quite quite a lot last year. And now they're moving uh, away from that. Campos, a lot isn't people. it? Uh, yeah, Campos. Um, so they're kind of building this team. And I think to have the, to be back on form quality wise is great. It's really great for them and they're going to take that as the big positive. Like Berlin has been a great track for them. So Mm. I think if they hadn't have maybe kind of taken a step forward in the season, then I think Berlin could have been a really tough one. Um, Whatever happens now for the rest of the races, like I think they can take forward the fact that actually, you know, they've been in Super Bowl, had two two drivers in Super Bowl today. I can't remember the last time that both Mahindra drivers were in Super Bowl. It's usually kind of one or the other and a lot with like with a lot of teams as well. So that's a great that's that shows that the car is there it's not necessarily like you know amazing lap I mean, although they were I mean Lynn's lap on Thursday amazing and Jerome did good today as well so yeah to start I think at one point the last the first five laps or something they were p2 and three like they're pretty racy and and they're they're a they're a strong and consistent team they've been there since the the first race like (laughs) they've got a lot of good intelligent people there who will be able to push forward to to season seven like we've got what another five six months until till santiago yeah it's a lot of time it's not it's january isn't it yeah so that's january yeah yeah Um, so i think i think there's definite positives to be made and especially like they're going to be feeling a bit weird that dillbag is is not there with them the track side it's the first races that he's missed um, but I hope he's he's proud of them because definite definite positivity there. Hopefully, fingers crossed. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, and it's nice to see Mahindra back in the mix because um, you know they, they've they've been a really entertaining team for the last few seasons, and and they really have had a not a brilliant start by their standards this year. So, uh, and I was wor- a little bit worried about them at the start of the season that they were gonna kind of really slide down the order but it's been a it's been a good break for them Dilbag even said that to me himself recently when I spoke to him he said he what he actually said was I don't want to trivialize the severity of COVID but if you look at it in terms of a pure break for us it's it's been good which I know what he means he says obviously they would have preferred to not have had the break and to have carried on racing but it's allowed them to to get their ducks in order a little bit and, and that's showing on track. Um, Oliver Rowland had a good um, day to day, it should be said. Uh, P9 to P6. Um, he seems to be um, 
chipping away with the points. He's a little bit off his ultimate sort of pace that we saw last season in terms of it looked like he was, you know, arguably what the, the next person to, to perhaps get a first race wing under their belt, but it doesn't seem to have happened, but, but at least he is getting points, which is good. I, I want to talk a little bit about Felipe Massa as well today, because um, I've got him in the who had a good day, but it, I mean, it ended up as a bad day, but I thought his race performance was quite good today. Um, so I've been quite critical of Felipe Massa recently, because I think he's had a very poor season. Uh, but today he was running in P6 and he'd looked much more competitive today. The most competitive we've seen him for quite a while. Uh, and then he picked up a penalty for an incident with Lucas de Grassi. Um, Dario said on the commentary that he felt that was quite harsh. I kind of agree. Um, anyone got any strong feelings on that that they want to share? Uh, I, I think generally the decisions about incidents like that have been unusually inconsistent uh, for Formula E. So like generally you might end up with quite a few penalties for, for causing a collision with a with another driver, but generally they will be fairly, they're often harsh, but they're at least harsh across the board. I think what's baffling about the Massa one and what makes it feel particularly harsh um, is that there's been other ones the previous two days, including one with Degrassi mm, um, yeah. on Jev, that uh, that haven't attracted that attention and, and that haven't been scrutinised. And I'm not I'm not really sure why. Um, and I think that was something that the drivers um, looked for in their driver briefing to have clarification on. Um, and they they were sort of instructed that you know this is this is how far you can take it and like no further or else you will get a penalty um and massa has fallen foul of that but yeah it, it does feel a bit i don't know maybe we'll be back to the this sort of usual fairly strict um enforcement of things but it, it, it feels a little bit odd and sloppy that it has been inconsistent um just because that's not normally what happens um i mean as it as it is, I, I think it probably deserved a penalty. The penalty felt harsh in proportion to other incidents which have happened and have not earned a penalty. But I think that's because the first ones were incorrect to not be penalised, not necessarily because Massa shouldn't have got a penalty because, it, I mean, it was just a dodgy move. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I felt it was a little bit harsh. Maybe I need to look at a few more replays of it, different angles, but I, I thought it was I thought it was a little bit harsh. But but it has to be said it was a much better race performance from Felipe today. Um running P six. It looked like he might have been on course for a decent bunch of points. Um let's move on then. Um quickly we'll rattle through a few of these. A couple of I feel bad because I feel like we constantly talk about him, but another day for <laughs> Collado today. Um, he was caught up in an incident with um, Sergio Seti Camera and uh, perennial haver of bad days, Neil Jarni. Um, basically what happened as I, my notes, I mean, you can take my notes if you want, but maybe go and watch the replay. It might be more reliable. From what I saw, Sims went up the inside of Seta Camera. Uh, Seta Camera then jumped on the brakes to defend his position. He made contact with Collado. Um, Seta Camera then got around the next corner and then stopped quite suddenly on track. Probably realised that his front suspension was kind of not really there anymore uh he, he went to pull off the racing line and then johnny kind of went straight into the back of him um i felt really bad for collado when uh, i don't know whether the radio was when he was back in the pits or whether he was on the way back to the pits but he said that um he said to his engineer no the car just doesn't feel right and then he he was like he just sounded so frustrated He's like, i just can't believe it like he was just like almost shouting. And he said, I've never been taken out that badly before. And you can just feel the frustration spilling over under that helmet. Hazel, um, Collado, he will want to forget this past a week. 
pretty uh, good. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just been disastrous for him. So Jaguar did end up scoring points. Um, Evans got up into ninth in the end. Um, and Collado had been ahead of him on track at the time when the incident... Yeah, qualified him, didn't he? Uh, he did, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, like Collado... Collado has struggled a bit in Formula E, as most rookies do. Um, but he, he outscored Evans over two races in Riyadh um, and then didn't really score anything else. Um, but, you know, it's just been like absurd bad luck. Like he's got to do these final races. Um, the, tomorrow might be his last race with Jaguar. But as far as we all know, there's a, a very strong likelihood their reserve driver Tom Bonfist will be stepping in for the final two races because there's a, a wet clash, um, which Collado still has a ride in, um, and it would feel pretty harsh given Jaguar dropping him to hold him uh, to the contract, especially because they've given him a horrible car that keeps like mm. trying to kill him and things, and and then just when things were going right, like you know, Sete Camera. Uh, 100% admitted fault to the accident. Um, Collado said, you know, he was just minding his own business, which is completely true. He was not involved in Sim's overtake of Seti Camera. Um, and he had nothing to do with Johnny. The, the whole thing just sort of ploughed into him uh, from behind. Um, uh, but, it, uh, yeah, God, I mean, you can't... Generally, Jaguar are having such a miserable time in Berlin, and it's honestly quite heartbreaking seeing their season fall apart so badly during um, a point when... Wheels really have fallen off, haven't they? Yeah. Literally, well, I mean, that's yeah. about the only thing yeah. that hasn't happened, actually, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, like, in a in a season where, like, the amount of effort and dedication they put into Formula E really seemed to, to sort of come good. Um, uh, and they, you know, with Evans, they were, they were launching a very credible title bit, like, it's just heartbreaking and like, you know, you, you see a Collado's sad post-race interviews are, are getting sadder and yeah. I don't know if I want to see it's tomorrow. It's getting hard to watch. You get a good result. Yeah, no. Mm. They're really, they're really, really hard to watch and just, yeah, heartbreaking really. A quick word on um, Neil Jarney because still no points for Neil Jarney and when you we talk about how Andre scored 30 in the last three races alone. It's really, it's tough, isn't it? Like for him, he must be thinking like, what do I have to do to, to just get this car into the points? Um, but it's just not, it's just not working. I don't know. Is it luck? Is it his driving style? Is it a combination of all of that? But it's just, Formula E just has not worked out for Neil Johnny, has it? Yeah, it's just that uh, scale, and you know, scaling that learning curve in in Formula E is is it's not impossible, but it's very very hard. And I think for Neil in particular, he is uh, he has a certain driving style that he's accustomed to with with the cars that he's driven in the past, and it's served him very well in the past. But it just has not. There's, there's, there's definitely a disconnect there in uh, when it comes to his driving style and um, the Formula E driving style that is required to succeed. Uh, so, and you know, there's w with with a with a, just an upended season like this, he hasn't had a lot of time in the car. There's very limited testing, and you know, every session there's just there's always some some calamity that has that has sort of befallen him. It's just. It's it, it's not it's not necessarily um, just bad luck. It's just that his 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 circumstances don't necessarily lend themselves to to good outcomes. Um, so it is you know, and especially with three races to go, um, it, it it can be very very demoralizing. So yeah, it's uh, definitely feel for him. Um, yeah, really tough. Um... Looks as though he won't be um, coming back next season. Uh, I would imagine as well, that's probably time on his Formula One career, uh, Formula E career as well. I, I don't expect to see on the Neil Johnny pop up anywhere else. I think he will probably get absorbed back into 
the Porsche. Uh, the um, massive, program. massive Porsche driver tent. Yes. Yeah. Um, Stoffer Van Dorn looked like he was on for another good finish today. He had a puncture, which the team confirmed was uh, through contact from Alex Lynn. Um, <clears throat> Stoffer said that he was he was looking good on energy, um, about the same as Ryan's, and he said he could have maybe challenged for a podium today, which is a bit bit of a shame because Mercedes have looked pretty decent since since they've come back. Um, Lou, I just want to ask you about um, Alex Lynn. Um, you've already talked a little bit about Jerome, but let's hear your thoughts on Alex Lynn. Um, first of all, it's been great to have Alex Lynn back and see him with a, with another shot at Formula E. And he had another really good qualifying today. Uh, he had another he had another good qualifying the other day. He's had two Super Bowl appearances in three races since he's come back. Um, I'm not entirely sure what happened other than that little contact with Van Dorn, but I don't think that's the reason why he finished 18th flag. So we're yet to find out what happened there. But um, overall, it's been a decent day for him. Um, good qualifying and a decent race up until something has clearly happened there at the end. Um, has he done enough, do you think, to put himself in, in with a shot at, at sticking around? Because I think he was unfortunate to be not in that Jaguar this year. Yeah, that's true, actually. I think he was really unfortunate not to, not to get that Jaguar seat. Like, I think, I think uh, if, like, Lynn, from what I, from my knowledge, Alex has had, prior to Berlin, one day in the Mahindra, and that was a test that I was at at Bedford. So he's literally done that and then gone straight into, like, it, <laughs> yeah. this epic two weeks of, of races. And actually, if you think about that <laughs> and you think about how he's had a considerable time out of the car anyway, he's actually, he's jumped in and done pretty well. Like to get yeah. to be in Super Bowl, to be putting those laps together when we know the car can do well. It's not like it's only Jerome who's, who's doing well. Like I think given that it's a brand new team, he's working with kind of new engineers, new setup and everything. And, and doesn't really have that kind of maybe that faith in the car like the drivers sometimes talk about the kind of like oh I can probably throw it into this corner or whatever because you, you kind of just you kind of gauge that and you get that trust over some time don't you and you know I think I think he's as far as I'm concerned I think he's done enough to keep the seat like I don't know quite what the contract negotiations and stuff are within Mahindra so I don't know whether it's Jerome and Lynn fighting for the same seat or whether they're whether this is just like a trial to see what they would, how they, how the partnership is. Um, but, but yeah, I think he's definitely done enough to be considered. <laughs> like, I, I would think, agree. I, I think, yeah, yeah, he's done a, he's done a stellar job getting into the car and we're only three laps, three laps in. No, we're not. We're three races in, uh, three two, six races. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, he's, uh, I'm, I'm interested to We only to see three what races into this. God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> but we're, we're halfway, halfway there. We're halfway there. It's and sad. also so living on a prayer. Bon Jovi. Right yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. with um, <clears throat> so we're only halfway through this. Um, but the well, we kind of know now. I think confidently where the championship is heading, but. It seems as though like anyone between second and tenth in the championship could finish second. <laughs> so mm. I, I, I really wouldn't have a clue uh, as to how that's going to shake out. But <clears throat> excuse me, um, Max Gunther is the biggest climber in all of this. He's moved up from P nine to P two in the standings. Um, De Grassi has 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 dropped down. Uh, but he's moved ahead of Stoffel Van Dorn. Evans is up to um, back up to fourth after scoring a couple of points ahead of Van Dorn. Big climber again. Uh, Andre Lotter has been on the move and he is up to sixth in the championship now, which is, is pretty cool. Big, big climb from him in the last three races, wouldn't you say, Hazel? <laughs> um, and then ninth, um, Jev has, has moved back up into the top 10, not where he wants to be, but you know, there's all to play for. He he could still finish 
you know, in the top three or four in this championship, I think, if he has a good couple of races to finish up. In other words, <laughs> typical Formula E. It's just all over the place after every race. Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, assuming De Costa wins it then, um, brief prediction from all three of you. Give me the top three in the championship at season end. Uh, Lou, you can go first. Oh, thanks. Um, okay, I'm going to go <laughs> De Costa, De Grassi, because I think Aldi are very good at putting together consistency when they need to, and, and Max. So I'm going. Max Ginter. Mm. Okay, interesting. Uh, Peter? Uh, if you don't think De Costa, you can say someone else. But... Oh, I mean, <laughs> I mean uh, let's say De Costa, Verne, and just for fun, Daniel Abt. It's, it's mathematically impossible. <laughs> but I would like to see him do well in that Neo. Just okay. because. They've just been sandbagging oh, all this time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. They definitely have been. Yeah. yeah. Really yeah. Well. I mean, it's really working. Okay. Definitely. The sandbags are definitely working. Uh, Hazel, your top three? Uh, De Costa, um, Gunter, um, and then it would be cool to see Evans make a recovery to third. He's still very Ooh. high up in the standings. Um, yeah. and, and if over the next three races he scores a decent haul, um, mm. I don't know if Jaguar are going to manage to really be front runners, but if he can hold on, then like it's, it's definitely not impossible he takes third in the end. Um, so, yeah. Um, and it would be... I feel like that would be representative of their respective seasons. Uh, in a in a way that the last three races yeah. have really sort of like pulled Evans apart in 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 a way that doesn't totally make sense. And so yeah, I I, I reckon if if they can find that consistency, then then he. I'm gonna stick my neck on the line and say to Costa, Gunther, Van Dorn. Mm. Oh, all right. I think Van Dorn has got a big result coming up, I think. Okay. Uh, maybe a win. That would be nice to see. Um, right. I think we are just about up for time. Um, <clears throat> our thanks to Lou and also to Hazel and Peter for, for their uh, time this evening. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'll edit this bit out. Although Hazel will probably leave this in on the video. <laughs> uh, she definitely will now have said that. Um, Lou, before we let you go, how can people follow you and where is best for everyone to find out about your work? Uh, so everyone can follow me on Lou Johnson Photo uh, on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, and that's where I keep pretty much everything up to date. Uh, if you want to have a look at my website, which will be changing very soon, uh, that's just leejohnsonphoto.com. There you go. Go and check out Lou's work because uh, it's very, very good. Um, so thank you very much for being on tonight, Lou. Um, thank you for having me. You're, you're very welcome. And um, you've, you've got a busy few days coming up. You're going to be working at the track or near, the, near to the track um tomorrow yes yep yeah so for every race i'm uh i'm shooting everyone kind of watching like this live screaming uh thing that's happening at the olympic park so not tempelhof but actually a very cool other building and a place in berlin so uh, yeah it's nice to be back with the formula e family even if i'm not in the pit lane very cool well it's it's um nice to see you back doing what you love um Make sure you subscribe to the podcast uh, so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. And please do consider leaving us a review um, as it really does make a difference to us and it helps other Formula E fans to discover our content. Inside Electric is an independently run website, so please also consider backing us on Patreon. And in return, you'll get some exclusive benefit, uh, benefits each month, uh, additional bonus content. Uh, we do a monthly Ask Us Anything video um you can get early access to our podcasts and access to the inside electric discord chat we are back tomorrow for race four in berlin and we'll be joined by naomi panther uh, naomi has worked in a number of roles in, in pr in formula e since season one 
and uh, she's worked with teams such as Mahindra and Jaguar and she's got some really great insight on the championship. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. I've been your host, Rob Watts. Uh, this has been the Inside Electric Podcast and we will catch you again very, very soon.